fucking Smetty here. Welcome to another edition of Golik and Smetty. I'm Mike Golik Sr. She is Jessica Smetana. And she is someone who got to enjoy something in person. Uh, something she has been enjoying. Uh, what for a couple of years now, Jess? You've been, you've been eh, into- sure. We'll we'll round we'll, up we'll, a, cu- we'll, a couple of years. We'll go with that. Um, F one was in Miami, and we we talk about that occasionally on on this podcast. I'm really new to it. It's, it's my son in law Ben Broniker, uh, who was into it and actually got me into it. And then I found found out Jess was so into it as well. And I've tried to learn more and more about it. But it was in Miami where Jess lives now. Uh, and it looked, and obviously the coverage was all over the place because it was in the United States, even though it doesn't really have a whole lot to do with U.S. sports. You correct me if I'm wrong on any of this. I mean, there's no, no like there's American no, drivers. There's no current nothing. American drivers. Yeah, right, you're right. right. So this is completely out of our country, yet we're trying to make it something big in our country. And I think it's growing without a doubt. And so it was in Miami this past weekend. Next year, it's going to be in Vegas, which I can't wait for. It's going to be down the strip. So Jess, the floor is yours. Give us your experience on this. Mike, I am so exhausted. It was so hot out this weekend. I was just, I melted into a puddle the three days that I was there. It was, I I can't even describe to you the weather in Miami. It was swampy and disgusting, but I had so much fun. It was really cool. I I was a credentialed media member, which meant I had access to the paddock, the pit lane, um, all the press conferences and interview pens and all of the areas where the drivers and the team principals were and where Sky Sports was. I ended up on Sky Sports, which was awesome. Really? Yes, I got to, It's I, I, I told the story on the Levitard show yesterday, so I'll, I'll give a, a abbreviated version, but I bumped into a Sky Sports presenter who who listens to my Formula One minute. I do I do 60 seconds of Formula right, One right. coverage every Monday after races on, on the Dan Levitard show. And he asked me if I would read part of this line in, in this like package that they were showing before the race. And I said, of course I'll do that. So I did it and it ended up airing on ABC and it was like a welcome to Miami thing. So that was really cool. Um, so that was an unexpected thing that happened. That was, that was awesome. My, my parents got to see me on TV. You've been on on ABC a million times, so it's not, not a big deal to you, but like, you know, I'm just a a, a little podcaster here. So that was awesome. I ended up on the ABC, uh, or the Sky Sports Formula One show that I watch, you know, every race. So that was really, really cool. Um, the cars were incredible to see in person. Watching the race was interesting because you're kind of stationed at one area and so you can't see you know the full race and see what's going on right right so i'm i don't want to say like i i question people who spend ten thousand dollars on it because you get like you know one turn of the track but i do kind of question it because it if you actually care about the sport following it on tv is much easier but as a media member, like getting behind the scenes access, getting to talk to you know reporters and drivers and meeting all these people, that was really, really cool. And I also, Mike, got to cover the W series, which is the all woman uh, racing series that is now going to be on ESPN the rest of the season. And it's a little bit different than Formula One because everyone drives the same cars. And so right. it's really a, a test of, of driving ability more so than Formula One, which is, you know, constructing a, a good car and driving ability. Oh, so but there's no, no different, it's not different everyone, types of Yes, maker. everyone okay. gets the same exact car and they switch out the engines after every race so that it's all kind of done randomly. You, right. don't, you know, someone doesn't get a better engine than someone else. Um, so that was really cool. And I had like incredible access to all of those drivers. I got to meet a bunch of them and talk to them and, you know, hold their, their racing helmets and s- was up close to their cars. I got to walk on the grid before their race on Sunday, which so, was I amazing. saw your picture there. Yeah. Oh my God. It was so cool. I've never been to any event like this before. And Mike shout out to the W series because they gave me the best piece of sporting merchandise that I have ever owned in my life. I got this purple and yellow reversible bucket hat from them look at how cool this thing is if you're watching (laughs) this on youtube you could see it it is the coolest thing i've ever owned in my life uh it's cooler than any nfl or or notre dame or college football merchandise that i've ever purchased so shout out to the w series because that was 
really cool and un unexpected that I was able to hang out with them for most of the weekend. So Mike, in short, I had a great time. I sweat my ass off. It was yeah. just miserable outside. I somehow finagled my way on ABC and Sky Sports, and I I really enjoyed it for my my first Formula One race. Okay, a few questions. Uh, and, and by the way, we're going to have Spencer Hall on here uh, as well. He was he was there. Uh, we're going to talk F1 with him. He's also a college football uh, guy as well. So we're going to talk some college football with some news coming out about the NIL and transfer portal and things like that. But a few questions. First, the heat. I saw it was hot. Listen, my last year I played in the NFL, 93 was in Miami. And it was freaking hot. When we, yes. This was when we had two a days, it was seven in the morning and six at night because it's yeah. just so freaking hot. Every We all know that, right? So is what did the drivers think of that? How, does it affect them and or the cars in a certain way at being that hot and humid? Yes, absolutely. So the the big thing with the cars when it's super hot is is the track temperature can cause more tire degradation. So they need to pit more often, um, which there, it ended up being for most drivers just a one pit race. But there was there were some issues with the asphalt getting overheated and bubbling. So they had to like re re uh, surface a couple areas before the race. So the heat does affect them. And then the drivers themselves obviously are are in like fire suits so they're covered head to toe sitting on the you know in their cars really low yeah. on the track so it's really hot for them and so you know they're allowed they have these like water bottles that they they suck on throughout the race to like stay hydrated but it is uh what like a lot of f1 commentators were saying it was a very physical race because you know you're you're sitting in the car for two and a half hours basically and you're sweating and you know these drivers lose like five or six pounds over the course of a race just from from sweating it all out um so i i can imagine it was it was a little miserable for them and like the formula one races and other like hot climates they had races already this season in bahrain and saudi arabia but the most of the reporters that i talked to said the closest temperature comparison was like malaysia and singapore because not only is it hot in miami but the humidity was just insane so like you you basically could not could not stand outside without just being drenched in sweat for you know two minutes so uh i moved in and out of the air conditioning i was very lucky that we had access to an air conditioned media center because i spent a few hours in there on sunday just trying to like maintain some sort of like <laughs> temperature right regulate my own temperature so that i didn't pass out during the race well that was so i was uh, i watched the race and i was happy I went on DraftKings Sportsbook, and I won in a couple of ways. I picked for Stappen to win. Now, that obviously, it wasn't a ton of money to, to pick the favorite. Right. And I also picked Ferrari to have two of the three spots on the podium. Wow, look yeah, at you. And, and, and I hit that one as well. So I was pretty I, – I did I did discuss with my son-in-law again because he is more – Right, he knows. As, as I'm learning more, he knows, and, and that's where he went. So I'll give credit where credit is due. So – I, I, I answer this, Jess, is so we have NASCAR, obviously, we have open wheel like Indy 500, uh, which is coming up uh, at, the, at the end of, end of the month. Mm -hmm. And now F1 comes in. What? So if it's going to grow in this country, how do you compare it to those styles of racing and how can it and will it become more popular in this country? That's a really good question. I think part of the reason that it has become more popular is because of Drive to Survive, the Netflix show, because I think that has introduced Americans to a lot of storylines uh, with drivers that you, you might not have really known anything about. And I think there's like mixed feelings from Formula One fans about how accurate the series is on Netflix. And if they, you know, play up storylines and pr kind of fabricate drama and those sorts of things. But um, I, it, whether or not it's, it's real or not, you know, it's a reality series on Netflix. So I think obviously you have to take every storyline right, with right, a grain of salt. Right, like yes. we, we've all seen, you know, reality TV and not everything that you see on reality TV, TV is true, but it does give you like just incredible access to the drivers. They, they do interviews like face to face with, with drivers before and after races and they follow certain drivers for certain races. So I think that has been the reason that it's gotten a lot more popular over the last few years. And, and now like the PGA is trying to do a Netflix show that's going to be a behind the scenes with the PGA that we've talked about on this show, I believe. So I think that that's the reason that it's grown so much. And Miami is a great example of uh, like evidence that it's grown because there were 
you know, hundreds of thousands of fans right, there. And right. now there's going to be next season, there's going to be three races in the United States. So there's going to be Austin, Miami and and Vegas next year. And so okay. in the past, there's only been one race in the United States in Austin. And even that last season, which is at the end of the Formula One season, towards the end, I should say, it's like in October and the season usually ends at the end of November, December. Um, that last season was, it, it broke attendance records. So I think it's proof that like Formula One has really arrived in the United States and it's probably in in effect because of the Netflix series and, and people being, people like me being bored during the pandemic and turning it on and then realizing like, oh, this is cool. and. I kind of get it now. I, I get how some of the, you know, mechanics and engineering works. I, I understand enough of it that if I turned on a race on, you know, Sunday morning, like I can follow along and figure out what's happening. So do you think most of the of the fans there, because it was packed, do you think most of the fans there who obviously have a lot of money to be there right. um, knew a lot about the sport or were just kind of there to either get introduced to the sport or just for kind of the visual of, this is the happening thing to do. And we know Miami people love to be at the yeah. happening thing. I think probably, I mean, certainly in the expensive areas, I think people were going for the party because there were like, I had friends who, not, I mean, not like friends, but people that I knew of who were at like these expensive events where they got like to see a Post Malone concert, like in the middle of qualifying. So I think there was like an aspect of like, this is what everyone's doing in Miami this weekend. I'm going to shell out, you know, a couple grand to go and see it and and see what all the buzz is about. But I also think that like I noticed and I don't know how you could even gauge this without doing some sort of like polling. I did notice in the grandstands and in kind of the general admission areas like everyone had on some sort of Formula One gear or apparel. I don't know if they bought it the day of the race. Right, right. Um, there were merchandise tents everywhere. And that merchandise, by the way, is so oh. expensive. It's crazy how much a, a Mercedes cap costs. I was watching I was watching uh, Nicole Briscoe on SportsCenter, and she said she bought the cheapest hat. I think it was a Mercedes hat. The cheapest hat was seventy five dollars. That's even less. That's even less than I would have uh, expected. <laughs> I, I saw a hat for ninety dollars, like a baseball cap with a Mercedes logo. I was like, I feel like I could get this at a car dealership in like New Jersey, and it would be free. But it was, it was awesome. Like, it, I, it did seem like there were a lot of people there who did genuinely care about the race in the areas where the tickets were, you know, more more geared towards people watching the race, like in the grandstands. Because there's certainly all those hospitality areas set up where you probably are sitting in a nice air-conditioned table drinking, you know, a, a beer or whatever, and, and you're probably not watching as much. And there were a lot of, there was a lot of different things for different types of people at, at this race, I think you could say. All right, well, Jess, we're going to continue with more on this as we bring in Spencer Hall, who was also in Miami at, at the race, also Spencer uh, great job in college football as well as the Shut Down uh, Full Cast podcast. Uh, thinking Out Loud, a weekly SEC hit as well there. So I want to, Spencer, I appreciate you joining us. I, we, thank you very much. And I, I do want to get into the college football part of this, especially with the latest in NIL. Well, all of a sudden, they're trying to go after kids now, which <laughs> just blows my mind. Mm -hmm. But uh, just talking with Jess about F1 in Miami. We know, as she said, we're talking about three places next year, Miami, Austin, and Vegas, which I can't wait for to go down the strip. But what were your impressions of this, not race, this event that hit on Miami where everybody loves to be seen? It's really overwhelming, I think, is the general take for anyone who is there because F1's the shiny thing, man. It is the shiniest thing in this, like a collection of shiny things, because you can say, like, I think somebody on their PR team really honed all the drivers on this and said, you need to tell Americans it's like the Super Bowl. It's like <laughs> the Super Bowl. Like, and Jessica's laughing because this is what the drivers said over and over again. I, I, really... I said it too, for, the, for, for just clearing yeah, the did. air. I did say it several times, and I do believe it, but continue, Spencer. Yeah, and it became like, it was the thing that people repeated until it became funny and sort of meaningless, because I don't think it's anything like the Super Bowl, because the Super Bowl itself is uh, a big, rough game played by these like big, rough dudes that sort of sandwiched in the middle of one long commercial. 
F1's different, man. It's not like one long commercial. It is sponsored by gigantic companies, right? The track itself is divided into neighborhoods that are like the Pirelli neighborhood, the Heineken neighborhood. <laughs> uh, the, Ro- the Rolex the, neighborhood. <laughs> the Rolex neighborhood. The crypto.com stretch, right? So that's there. But when I've been to a Super Bowl, you don't really sort of experience the kind of <sighs> There's at least something at the core of it, which is about like violence and competition and big dudes who would not be invited back into like the VIP at Monaco. That is, that's not happening. At an F1 race, there's just this entirely different world that lands like a UFO kind of wherever it is and puts itself down. And it's the kind of place where, yeah, Tom Brady's in the paddock, but like more people are paying attention to the drivers than him. For an American, that's kind of mind bending. That's a little, that's that's really, really weird to see where you go, yeah, like Michelle Obama just ran past me with her whole security detail out of the paddock and people are pointing to Charles Leclerc yes. and going, hey, look, it's Charles Leclerc. Like, what, did you just- I think I was the only there? person who who noticed Michelle Obama walking out Spencer when, when she no, walked you had, out. No, you, I was you like, had to point her out, you had to point her out to me because I was looking at- <laughs> I was looking at a driver. Trying to find Lando Norris. I think, Spencer, the comparison to the Super Bowl for me is is not so much the sporting event itself, which I agree is, is really nothing like the Super Bowl. It's the week of stuff. Like you have yeah. these parties all week in Miami where all these different, you know, these DJs who normally would be a really big deal if they're coming to town for for a weekend in Miami. It's like they're an afterthought because there's they're so four many of, and they're four there's, of them. Yeah, there's like seven of them. They're all friends with Daniel Ricardo somehow and they're uh, they're course. in they're in the paddock. I couldn't pull any of them out of a lineup cuz they're all DJs, but um mm-hmm. yeah, like the the week of stuff was is really like it might like it the race landed in Miami like Monday of that week, and there was an entire string of, of things going on that I think was similar to like the lead up towards the Super Bowl with all these different celebrities. You have Tom Brady yeah. and Lewis Hamilton golfing um, to promote some like bajillion dollar watch company that I yeah. can't even pronounce because it's Swiss. Yeah. Uh, like stuff like that and all, all the parties and all the different like hotels being taken over by by different teams like that really did remind me of a Super Bowl event. Yeah, you're on the sidelines and the, the thing in, at the core of it, there is a race and there's just something to the eye that's strikingly different about putting tiny little men in machines that go 200 miles an hour sideways. That's like that is that's undoubtedly like there's all this hoopla and there's all of this event and yeah like all of the rich people who put this on got richer like 100 percent. Stephen ross was like the big pusher behind this and by my understanding they made out handsomely there's an entire party built around it but when the race starts and when qualifying starts there's this thing in the middle of it that is just gripping like like in every sense of the word gripping like you can't really take your eyes off something moving that fast at speed so uh, for me, like I'm a gearhead and I'm a speed addict, and um, it was one of the coolest things I've ever been to. Okay, so I'm fascinated with this in the fact that that uh, Spencer, I talked about you covering college football. The NFL is far and away the most popular sport yep. in this country, and college football is probably second before you get to any of the other majors. So before you came on, I was talking. We were talking just about NASCAR, an open wheel with the Indy 500 at the end of this month. Where and how much can F1, I don't know the right term, dent that come into play as far as being accepted in America and being a popular, one of the popular sports? I think they can pick up on it. Uh, they can pick up significant ground on most American sports because they have a guaranteed on-ramp welcome seminar. They do. You know, when you show up to a company and they're like, please watch this 30 minute video that explains what we're about and you sleep through it. You don't do that with that <laughs> once. It's Drive to Survive and it's an entire bingeable Netflix series. Americans need TV to understand something. They need it. And specifically, this generation of Americans needs it to be explained on a streaming platform. F1 yes. beat everyone to that. And they beat everyone to that. Like you, you get, you know, Hard Knocks is a show that the NFL says, well, here is our access product. This one team, the people from hard from the people from Drive to Survive, y'all, they're embedded with the teams. You don't know who's shooting what because 
they're wearing the outfits of the teams they're embedded with. So even with out Max Verstappen and Red Bull participating in this, without teams doing full participation, they already have a way to reach out to viewers and say, well, here's exactly what this is about. Oh, and we give access to our characters. That's the reason people fall in love with it, I think. You know, like I, I, I love the gear. I love the speed. I love the sport. But people watch things for stories and characters. And if you don't give them that, they'll tune out. That's one thing that F1, I, I think, mostly accidentally figured out with Drive to Survive. I don't think they thought Drive to Survive would be this big. I don't think that they thought they would have to do it this long. The other thing that Americans, I think, really like is something that's portable. It is a sport that is made for television. The most common comparison is golf. When you're at a tournament, what, what do you see hole by hole, Mike? When you go to a tournament, do you have any clue what's going on, really, no. if you're just watching it? No. No. So if you are at a an F1 race and you're at one turn, you literally have to count. You have to go like, one two three four okay now it's one three two four somebody passed somebody if you watch it on tv somebody's weaving it into a seamless coherent narrative and if nothing's happening at the front oh look we're looking at three and four back here and you tell the whole story around that i think that's where they can cut in i think that they can be really really successful are they going to hit a point where they're overvalued yeah absolutely dude they are 100 going to hit a point where maybe somebody pays too much for it and we go okay it's actually right here but to me, as a TV product, which is where the sport counts most in terms of the price tag and in terms of potential, um, it is way up there for me. And I, I'll say this last bit, women, they can pick up women in terms of viewership, because I know more women who are into this sport because, yeah, you can pick it up just by watching the show. And when you watch the race, it's two hours. It's two hours. Right. There's a lot of interesting characters. There's a lot of interesting storylines. And I think that's something that struck me is that I know more women who've gotten into F1 and want to talk about it. Want to like, it, it's really wild when, you know, like your aunt's like, oh my God, do you know Charles Leclerc? And you're like, no, I don't, I don't know him, but I know of him. It's like, oh, Ferrari's doing real well. And you're like, what? <laughs> like, this is not, <laughs> it's not what I expected, but it's like the, the most pleasant, it's the, it's the most pleasant element of that for me because I love to see it. I do. Yeah, that's interesting. I, I haven't thought of like if Formula One is trying to specifically market towards men and women. I think like sport in general can and should be both. Like there's no reason why, you know, women shouldn't and, and aren't fans of, of other sports leagues. Like you mentioned anecdotally, I do think there are probably a lot of female fans of other leagues and they just don't get they get ignored a lot of the time. So yeah. I don't know. That's an interesting point. I, I would like to think on think on that and follow up on that in my in my spare time um spencer you mentioned like the in-person fan i guess watching the race thing and and like that was something that i hadn't considered really as a spectator because i usually watch it on tv and i will probably continue to for the rest of the season and i don't have any plans to go to monaco but um was there anything that surprised you as someone covering it in person for the first time was there any like things that you thought would be better, things that you think are, you know, they could do better? Like, what was your kind of in-person fan experience for the race? Two things. One, that that everything is faster and louder than I thought it was going to be. It's so much faster. Like, it is just a different universe. I've gone to, like, NASCAR races, and I've gone to rally car uh, events, and the speed that these cars move with and the precision – and the daring like we watched somebody pass from ninth to 10th on our little turn that we had somebody passing from ninth to 10th and it like the roof shot off in the little tent we were in because it just looks like impossible you just go you shouldn't do that in a car and they just <laughs> pulled ahead um so that's the first thing that surprised me the second thing is that this is a military operation all right to do a continental race i was talking with one of the f1 guys to do a continental race meaning a race in europe um, at one of the major tracks there, they take four, Red Bull takes 45 trailers, 45 trailers, 45, yeah. 45, 45 flatbeds, right? Like 45 trailers worth oh. of stuff. Uh, the number of engineers, you talk to an Indy car driver or you talk to a NASCAR driver and they'd say, well, we have like 10 to 20 engineers, you know, Mercedes or Red Bull, they're going to have 50 or 60 in terms of people just looking at the car. So it is 
it is a bigger operation than I thought. And it is a faster operation at ground. Like I thought the core product, like I knew there was going to be uh, an amount of stunning hoopla around it. I didn't know what we were going to get was, was what I saw on the track, which is just like all of that work going into this one car and then seeing it applied is um, for a nerd like me, you know, who also has an adrenaline problem. Incredible. Like that's, yeah, I'll watch that all day. So I, I want to get to some college football, but Lewis Hamilton had been the name forever, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. And all of a sudden Mercedes. Now we, we did see what a, what a, what were they? Uh, they finished this week. Um, they finished five, six, right? Is that where they, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We went, we went, yeah. uh, Hamilton, Russell. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, no, sorry. So, no, Russell. Russell, 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 Russell Hamilton. Russell it's, overtook Hamilton. It was very, very yeah. Yeah, dramatic in the Mercedes I, I, path. I, I, but they're trying I to downplay that. it now. Yeah. So, so Lewis Hamilton had been the name for so many years. So I guess just like we ask in other sports, is it good that the dynasty, I don't want to say over, but is paused now when we have other drivers that, by the way, they're what, 24 and 27, Claire and, and Verstappen? I mean, it's, or, or mm-hmm. both 24. It's ridiculous how young they are. But is it good, do you think, again, from an American standpoint, that it's not Lewis Hamilton always at the top and we have others now? I'm always like, questions like that are always tricky because I go, well, man, I don't, I don't know what's good for the sport. I know what I like. I like Lewis Hamilton, uh, but I also like competitive races. So I would like to see Hamilton remain competitive especially because I have nothing but the most immense respect for him as a human being. Like Lewis Hamilton is somebody who has gotten there by not being a child of privilege. A lot of these dudes are rich. A lot of these dudes came up right, really, right. really wealthy because getting into motorsport in Europe particularly is an extremely expensive endeavor. You need mom and dad writing some checks to get that cart to get you into F3, into F2, and then eventually into F1. Sometimes maybe dad's a billionaire and he just buys a whole race team that (laughs) has happened. Okay. On multiple occasions to get son a seat in F1. Now you still got to stay on the track. Okay. Right. The wild thing, because you can go, well, dad bought you a track. And I'm like, yeah, but you're still hanging in there. You don't put it at the wall every week. Like, I think that's only happened once or twice really in the history of the sport, but on the whole, I think it's good. If Lewis is there, I think it's also good if it's more, competitive overall especially because again drivers are personality tests right like you're an eagles fan right i, I pretty much know what kind of person you are if you're an eagles fan like Steelers. i know what I'm you a, like I'm a, I'm a Steelers fan spencer you're a Steelers. Please. i know what you like like i sort of have like <laughs> i have a general pick of whether you're going to be i love the bad guys or i love the good guys and i think the same thing happens in f1 by the way right now you like the terminators of the world you like the assassins you like the cold-blooded sharks you're a max verstappen fan because that man has ice in his veins, you know? Do you like something a little more uh, a little more elegant? Why, well, you're a Ferrari dude, 100%. By the way, y'all, Jessica, tell them about, do you see the Ferrari, the Ferrari espresso machine? We've discussed the Ferrari espresso. Oh, my God. Oh. Yes, it was, it was gorgeous, Mike. I'm an espresso uh, addict, and Ferrari had this entire, like, European cafe set up outside of their paddock. It was very, very beautiful. Yeah, like a church organ of... <laughs> <laughs> an espresso maker so just imagine espresso made with ferrari engineering that is wow very literally what they had set up right so all these italian guys like drinking teeny little cups of espresso <laughs> again I, I i'm i'm charmed whenever you live up to the positive aspects of a national stereotype you walk by ferrari everyone is just italianing as hard as they can italy like it is ah. it's beautiful uh, Spencer, so just like everyone was calling uh, Formula One in Miami the Super Bowl for the last couple of weeks, uh, we've also been hearing everyone call this new college football landscape the Wild West. It has become now a very overused trope to describe the the transfer portal, the NIL situation happening. Um, but I think you can probably speak pretty well to the fact that college football has always been the Wild West. So. Uh, can you kind of tell us about about how this is just more of the same from from college football? Yeah, it doesn't seem that different. Now we just get a better idea of the price tag for a player. That's the and those players, by the way, uh, on the whole, it's not an evenly distributed landscape. You might have 15 or 20 players who are going to command big money. Everyone else is just fighting for deli endorsements, which I, I'm proud to say a lot of linemen signing up for like group barbecue deals, yep. like barbecue joint sponsor in the whole line. 
Shouts out to them. That's that's beautiful. Uh, but on the whole, like like whenever anyone says the Wild West, uh, I'm also kind of a history dork. I want to remind everybody uh, the Wild West after a certain point really wasn't that violent, right? Like there, were, it was actually more just a matter of hustle uh, and trying to cheat someone out of like land. That's really what like a lot of it after the initial violence, that's what it was. And this is what that is. It's people fighting over territory and not necessarily doing it um, with like above the board means. Now we just have to get you on taxes. That's it. Like, like you go, well, what's the big deal? Well, the big two big deals are this. The coaches now have to actually learn how to learn a new skill and how to function in this environment. Roster management becomes very complex. And that's why you've seen um, like guys like Billy Napier at Florida have hired more and more and more and more people. And you go, well, what is this bureaucracy for? This bureaucracy is for the same thing that NFL departments have scouts for. And, and have guys who look at the payroll and analyze the roster. Roster management is going to be more than a full-time gig for a lot of people at the college football level now. The second thing is that I don't have any pity for those coaches or for anybody who has to learn that new skill because this is the way it should have been a long time ago. And we're still not to the point where the actual money, the TV money that goes into these deals is distributed directly to players. We still have to do it indirectly. So is it the Wild West? No, no, it's not even it's not even close to me. This is just getting closer to an actual competitive market where we properly value players and have bid on their services, just like every other 18 to 22 year old professional with a desirable skill. There, I'm off. I'm off my my Apple box. Right now, listen, it, it, it's good to be on that because some of this stuff just absolutely pisses me off of what's going on. And I'm with you about the coaches. I mean. All I hear is how tough it is for them with the transfer portal and NIL. I don't who, deal with it. All right. I mean, everybody mm-hmm. adjusts. So now the coaches have to adjust as well. And this latest thing, Spencer, that has come out where these companies that are created to pay players before they get to the school, I think they call them collectives or whatever. The, the ADs have basically gotten together and saying they want to outlaw. Okay. You can give an opinion on whether you think that should be outlawed or not. But the ridiculousness, because when this thing started in July, the NCAA Pontius piloted it, just washed their hands of it. I talked to multiple commissioners who have said, we can fix it. And the others that say, no, the government has to fix it. Now these ADs want to go back in time and say, if you were one of these companies when this thing started, we're going we're gonna to hit you with sanctions. Well, I, I, that blows my mind, the audacity of, of them trying to do that. I can't imagine there's any way that any player or and or booster would get in trouble for what happened in the beginning of this. Would you agree or disagree? No, I fully agree. It makes absolutely no sense to do that. Additionally, and I would remind everyone involved of this, do not consent. Do not consent. Don't. You do not have to accept the NCAA's authority on anything because they do not exist. Why do you, what's the incentive? They're not, that's not the cops. That's not the law, right? Am I good with the IRS? Cool, right? Am I good with my coach? Cool. Um, Can you prove anything? Well, guess what? I'm not going to cooperate. We're going to stall everything. I'm going to go ahead and get my two to three years in and anything you find retroactively, the school's not going to assent to because they don't want to lose eligibility on everyone else. There's absolutely no ability to enforce, no enforcement measure. And most importantly, no reason to cooperate with any of this. These are people ex- exercising the same rights in the free market that a lot of these same people champion in every other portion of their life, every other sector of their society. They believe this is what should happen except for this. So tough. Yeah, deal with it. Also, coaches, y'all make six mil a year. Yes. Y'all make, y'all make six mil a year. I know some way more stressful jobs for 60K a year that are way more important, right? Like if a firefighter is complaining, I'm going to listen about how you're not paid enough or how you have to learn a new skill. Okay. But a coach, like, like societally, by the way, not exactly the most essential job. Okay. Not saying y'all don't do important things or mean a lot to people, but if we got to decide between the firefighter or the coach, probably going to select the firefighter. Speaking of the IRS, Spencer, uh, I've, I've heard a lot of college football coaches and administrators talk about like the tax implication of, of football players now making since money. W- since when I, do y'all care? Spencer, exactly. I, I was going to say, so uh, any other student in college 
can make money at a job. I had a job while I was at Notre Dame all three years. It was minimum wage in Indiana, which was like $7 an hour. So that sucked. Yeah. But I figured out how to pay my taxes. And I, I keep getting reminded every time I hear like some excuse like that from coaches and administrators, I'm reminded of how like they have the authority and the power to like hire someone on their staff that can like teach football players how to set up a TurboTax account. And so like all of these excuses to me are just kind of getting in the way of the fact that like these people can control this entire ecosystem if they actually care about player welfare and like especially football player you know help helping football players setting up things in their you know in their staffs to make football players understand how to not get cheated by an agent who some shady college football player agent who's gonna come out of nowhere mm -hmm. and take 20 percent of whatever nil deal they have like that seems within their control, right? Like we can do some things here that are going to help our, our players that are on our team. Yeah. Stop wallet watching. Why do you care about that? Do I, do I get up in an AD's face whenever they get $30,000 worth of wood paneling installed in their office for no reason? Do I get up in my coach's face when he says, yeah, the, the, uh, the athletic department has decided that the facility needs a slide. Clemson has a slide. <laughs> yes, they do. Right? Am I? And, and you know what? Clemson and some have... some lady broke her ankle on it during a during a visit to their facility once. <laughs> oh god! Yeah, that slide complained. cost a lot yeah. of money. <laughs> that slide cost the department a lot of money. And you know who uh, won't say anything about it? Me, because they can go ahead and spend it. I will use it as a point of contrast, though, to anybody who would say, "Well, what are they going to do about their taxes?" I don't know. You know, most 18 to 22 year olds in Florida, where I was at, at the time, did with their taxes. They didn't pay them. And that's why they were working at bartenders at Bennigan's when they were 23 and 24. Like, yeah, that ah. IRS will come after you. OK, that's <laughs> that's that's live and learn. And that's hard. That's hard lessons of adulthood. If that's what happens to you. Right. Fortunately, players are pretty smart, way smarter than people, uh, I think, in charge uh, have been prepared to deal with. Like that's one like one last thing. I've been stunned at how stunned some coaches and administrators have been by how savvy players have been about all of this. And that's telling. That's telling to me because um, if there's one thing I think you learn coming up on the internet, it's that the teens will roast you, the kids will get you, and they're way faster and way smarter than you give them credit for, and you need to be ready for that. And I, I think that coaches, assistants, and staffers uh, and especially the administration, they've been caught flat-footed by just how smart kids are when it comes to dealing with a lot of this. Yeah, it's either they're stunned or they, they don't want to accept it or yeah. don't want to think that the kids can actually be that smart. All right, Spencer, one more before we let you go. And this, this is really kind of a macro approach here. Again, I was in the, in the presence of a couple of uh, commissioners and both felt that the NCA and I think everybody, it's, this certainly isn't rocket science, that the NCA is just a mess right now. In, in, in that macro view, what do you see is or as the future of the NCAA as far as governing athletics? Hopefully none. They've had very little to do with football, period. That's something I think a lot of people misunderstand, that revenue-wise, the NCAA pays attention to what pays its bills. And what pays its bills most is a basketball tournament that they sell every single year that is broadcast in March. And that is billions and billions of dollars that they make off of this. They make very little off of football. And it's one of the reasons that football is so contentious and disorganized because that money goes to conferences on the whole, which is then distributed to said schools. So when they say like, oh, college football needs a commissioner. Good luck. How? How? How are you going to get all these people together, right? The most order you're going to see in college football is in the formation of something like the Premier League, something like a Super League, where there's going to be 32 uh, to 48 teams that really hold sway in terms of pulling the money from TV. That's what's going to happen. Sort of a super SEC, Big Ten, with some like ACC and Pac-12 and Big 12 sprinkled in there. So the NCAA, in terms of the future of enforcement, um, I would hope none. I don't think that if you look back, and this is damning, like, and I want it to be damning, go back and look at the NCAA's impact on the sport as a whole for college football. It's been largely negative. It's largely no, right. negative. They, they, it's mostly been a parasitic organization whose contributions to the product on the field and the students' lives has been one of harassment, disqualification, and in some cases, real financial ruin for players who lost eligibility, had to take a back road to the NFL. Um, if they're gone, then good. They've been nothing but a scourge. 
Well, Spencer, we really appreciate the one-two punch F1 and and college uh, the college football talk. Again, can you tell everybody where you'll be seen and or heard all the time? I know you're in more than a few places out uh, there. Yeah, it's it's a hustle, y'all. Yes. Uh, so for, first and foremost, there's the newsletter channel six. This is all on my Twitter bio at EDSBS. You can go through all of them. That's two things a week for 10 bucks. I highly suggest that you subscribe and not just because I get some of the money, but because it's good. I'm writing about the uh, Miami GP and it's going to be out later uh, today or early tomorrow. I'm also doing the shutdown full cast, which uh, currently on hiatus, but we are uh, working on getting that back with a uh, new partner. It's very exciting TBD. I am also on Thinking Out Loud on the SEC Network in the fall. I do some broadcast work, uh, um, including, yes, uh, evidently I do F1 now um, uh, ah. for ESPN Digital. And also you can see me uh, most Mondays on Debatable uh, with the death lineup of uh, Pablo Torre and Dominique Foxworth and our producer, Alistair. Jess, like, Jess, did I forget anything? I might have forgotten something. Wow. I, I'm trying to think. I, I feel like you got all of it. Boy, okay. that, that that is the hustle is real, and and I, with debatable, my son Mike talks about how he loved going on that, and when he was with ESPN, he really enjoyed. Man, it is like like well. it is the it is the best show because you go, oh, we're going to talk about that, and they're like, nah, we're not going to talk about. It. It's on the screen, and they're like, let's talk about something else. Like, and <laughs> that, that's my jam. It's a beautiful thing. Well, keep the hustle going, Spencer. We appreciate the time. Thank you. All right, thanks, Mike. Thanks, Jessica. So, Jess, uh, I mean, talking to Spencer, very interesting. Obviously, the F one, I. I I'm really interested to see it continue to grow and how it will grow in the sport. And I wonder, I I got one more question for you on it before I talk about some of the things he said in college football. Do you think, like we said, next year there are three races in the U.S., Austin, Miami, and and Vegas. Do you think for it to become even more popular, there will need to be more races in the U.S.? Ooh, that's a good question. I'm, I could certainly see there being more races in the U.S., like especially something on the East Coast, like in New York even. I think there's probably a lot of fans up here. But I do think that there might be some hesitance from or hesitancy from from like Formula One people to have too much in North America at the expense of taking away some historic race sites in Europe. So like, I guess that would be a balancing act for Formula One to figure out. Like you don't want to alienate the fan bases you have in like Belgium and and Germany, you know, with races there potentially being taken off the schedule. Um, I think the Germany race actually is not on the schedule this year, but I I need to double check on that. Um, But yeah, like they're they're certainly going to go where the money is though. And if that means, you know, a fourth race in in North America, I think something in New York would make a lot of sense uh, just geographically. So I don't know. I'm just, I don't know. I don't have any insight, really insight information, but I think I wouldn't be surprised, but I think it's a, it's a tough balancing act for them. Money, money does not seem to be anything that's hurting in F1 at all. It is, it is amazing. And then lastly, on, on the one thing Spencer said at the end about college, where he thinks it'll end up being a 32 or 48 team super league. I remember when I was finishing ESPN, when me, Mike, and Trey were, were had the morning show then, they talked about that as, as well. And, and I kind of disagreed. And the reason I did is because I asked, I think, the simple question that is not so simple, who runs it? Who, right. who, who runs that league? Don't, don't tell me the commissioners if they all kind of get together of those teams because does, does Greg Sankey think that any other commissioner should have any voice over him? Right. Right. I mean, yeah, I, I, you're bringing up a really good point, which is that like college football has never had a, a like a leader. Like there's never been a central organizing figure in college football like there is with professional sports leagues that have commissioners that work on behalf of the owners. So I don't really know what that leadership structure looks like. And I also don't know, like if we're moving closer towards a future where players are employees that can collectively bargain um what that would even look like with the current conference structure set up like I I don't know who I guess you're bargaining are there separate unions that bargain you know with one conference leader is there a centralized leadership structure I don't really know but I think like the the fact that players players are finally getting paid at least and like the NCAA has been exposed to more people as being as Spencer uh as Spencer I don't even remember the word he used. It was it was very strong, but you know, they're they're worthless <laughs> to college football. Like that's I think that's a step in the right direction. I, I agree. I, I guess my question is everybody says it, we're going to this, but then I, I then I try and ask, okay, who's gonna run it? 
Right. I mean, are they gonna are they gonna hire a commissioner? Do you hire a commissioner just for football? I have no you know, idea. I guess yeah, because I, I know conferences. I didn't the Pac-12. I thought somebody was gonna a commissioner was was going to be hired or or a football someone to just overlook football in right. conferences. I, I don't know, and that's that's going to be my biggest question: is who will lead all this? Obviously, we'll we'll see where the, where that Not goes. Not me. Um, no. Oh my God. <laughs> Stay well, away from that. Mess. Jess, Jess, you don't know what it pays yet. You know, maybe. Uh, well, that's true. Enough. You know, yeah. in true college football form, it will probably pay a lot. You know, uh-huh. a lot more than uh, what players will be getting paid. That that's true, Mike. Yeah, I would I would agree with that. All right, let's let's finish up on a little basketball because you have one that's just starting and the others that that is uh, in into the second round of the playoffs. WNBA, you know, gets off uh, on a start couple games in you know the aces were the the favorite las vegas aces out of the gate they're still on they're undefeated as of the the uh the uh, taping of this podcast i think there were two teams they and the mystics in washington as well we'll see where it all goes but uh there's also i i think kathy engelbert who the commissioner of the WNBA, did did throw out some interesting news about where she thinks it might be headed yeah, so so last week there were you know roster cuts. Uh, N- Neka Gumake and Brianna Stewart both had comments about how they were unhappy to see such high draft picks from the WNBA yeah. draft get cut from from their teams and from from a lot of teams. And so there was some you know some chatter about this is the time to you know expand the WNBA, and that that's been the feeling for a while I think among a lot of WNBA fans. Um, because the WNBA has 144 players, 12 teams, and a hard salary cap. So a lot of teams don't even carry all 12 players that they're uh, right. able to because they have to stay under the hard cap. And so there's, you know, there's some speculation about, like, what the correct way to, like, approach that is, whether it's, like, creating a developmental league right. or expanding two more teams, which is kind of what the uh, WNBA commissioner uh or president, I guess she's president, right? What she, what she said. So I don't really know what the right, I'm not, I'm not a smart person, so I don't really know what the right thing is, but I do think she is a commissioner. I'm wrong. Um, I do think that um, there are some really exciting places where the WNBA could expand. Bringing back the Houston Comets would be awesome. Putting a team in the Bay area would be awesome. Um, So all of those things are good and they're signs of, of growth. And I think this, like we said on last week's show, like this season has been, there has been more coverage of this season right, than right. any season previously. So that those are all good things, even though they, you know, are, are the result of, of very big problems, which are top draft picks, not making rosters. Well, that's the thing. Way. I mean, to, but to, to your, to your point, something has to change, right? I mean, you can't pare down rosters and keep the number of teams the same. You're not developing talent that way. So something has to happen here correct yeah i think definitely and like there there's no reason why it it's why it has to be the way that it is when like everyone wants the league to grow everyone can see that it's going to grow the WNBA is going to renegotiate their their rights uh on tv in the next couple years and get a a lot more money and then you know the the cba that they just negotiated was amazing and like and like record setting but you know once that expires i think there's going to be even more to you know distribute out to players salary wise there's also with the uh detainment of britney griner in russia right now which we we haven't really covered a lot but i think is something that is going to start getting talked about more and more as the season's going on the, the WNBA put like her initials on the court and on jerseys and, and things like that like there's a lot of questions about why the best players in the world need to travel overseas to make salaries, right. especially in countries that, you know, aren't as, uh, you know, aren't the United States, basically. Like, why why should we send our best players overseas and put them potentially in danger, like Brittany Griner, who's now wrongfully detained, the United States says. Right. So that's been a big, a big area of, of criticism and question and... Uh, there's going to be, I think there is going to, it seems like be some change that comes out of all of this. So we'll see where that goes in the NBA. Obviously it's not a tomorrow fix uh, for that, but league has started, as you said, most coverage or season has started most coverage they've, they've gotten. So all going in the right direction from that standpoint in the NBA, again, as a taping of this, we just saw a couple of games, um, Memphis and golden state. That one is three, one now golden state and Memphis. Had a lead in that one. I thought that was interesting. 
that Golden State basically was not playing well, but it was never more than a few possessions behind. They come back and win that. They have a 3-1 lead. John Morant doesn't play on that one after being hurt in the game before with what he said broke the code. If I got to hear any more about the code, I mean, where Jordan Poole was going for the ball when they trapped him and he grabbed his knee instead of the ball and John Moran is treating broke the code. I mean, are we serious here? John Moran is a great player, but that broke the code. You reached and grabbed the knee. Give me a break uh, on that. You know, the Dylan Brooks swipe across the head of, of what Gary Payton the second ended up breaking his elbow. I mean, on the landing, uh, that that was that was a, a bad hit. But some of this stuff, I I just don't uh, I I don't understand. But either way, I think Golden State's going to move on there. I'm I'm loving just the Boston Milwaukee series. Uh, that that one now is tied to two. Boston gets the win. Al Horford, who's about 80 years old, was out of his mind in this one, scoring 30 points, most he ever had. Uh, in the playoffs, put a poster move, slam on Giannis, got a technical because his arm hit him in the face on the way down. Though Giannis got a technical earlier when he slammed on Horford and then said something to him for taunting. But I, I listen, as a former defensive player, I love these teams, the physicality they have on defense. So I'm loving this one. It's physical. Sometimes I wish the refs would just let it go a little more and not blow the whistle so much. But right now, that that is that's the most I think physical and best defenses we have in the series going on. Yeah, Bucks Celtics feels like it could be an Eastern Conference uh, Finals like championship yeah. game series. Like it's it's been really fun to watch. And then on the other side is the Heat in the 76ers, and now yeah. with Joel Embiid back, it looks like that's going to be. Uh, more interesting than than people thought. So I don't know, Mike. I I have no idea who my favorite is to win either of the series in the East. I think Golden State seems like they're probably yeah probably gonna end up in the finals. I don't know. I don't know what you think, but the East no, I, the East yeah. is pretty interesting to me. I think the East is more interesting in the West now. I think it's kind of reversed a little bit, as you mentioned. You know, uh, Miami's up two zip in that series, and Embiid comes back and he goes. 18 and 11, 24 and 11, and they get both the wins. There were those that were saying, even if Embiid comes back and he came back from the orbital fracture and the mild concussion, that Philly would still lose the series 3-1 or 4-2. And all of a sudden, it's 2-2. And as everybody kind of going, wow, same thing with Dallas and Phoenix. You know, Phoenix, best record in all of basketball. Monty Williams wins coach of the year. And Dallas ties that series up. 2-2 2-2 two, two as well. So some of the series, three of the series, again, at, at the taping of this, some will change by the time this pod is released, but at the taping of this, three series at 2-2 two, two and one at 3-1. So uh, getting some good competitiveness, maybe more than some of the favorite teams want at this point, uh, but we'll see where it goes. But it's uh, it's been pretty pretty fun to watch. So I'm glad, Jess, that to, to end this, you got to experience uh, that F1. Now, are you going to try next year to go to all three of the races that's a good question i don't know i mean vegas feels like it's going to be too crazy for me i'd rather if, if i can if i'm opting in and out of races and, and money's not an issue and like metal arc sending me all over the world or right. DraftKings, whoever wants to sponsor this um i want to go somewhere in europe i want to go to barcelona i want to go to silverstone uh I, vegas just vegas is great for a couple days but if right. it's anything like miami was but I think it's going to be a little bit more than that. It's probably going to be too much for me. Like just the logistics of it being on the stri- the race being on the strip, like it seems like it's going to be totally crazy, Mike. So I, I would like to opt. I'll opt into Austin. I'll obviously be in Miami. Um, and maybe I'll opt into like Silverstone, like go to the UK, quick flight, just knock one out there. I was thinking that in, in the, the uh, kind of the offshoot of something, that Vegas race, could you make, you know how hotels have the regular hotel room, then you have a lake view, which is a little more expensive and this and that. Imagine the upper levels of the hotels that are right along the strip where the race is going to be, the upper levels of the hotel rooms facing that of how much they're going to go for. Yeah, I again, it's too much. It's too much for me. I I will opt out of Vegas and I will opt into something. You know, it'll it would probably be cheaper to fly to Portugal for the race there. Like it, no joke. So, um, but wherever I go, I'm gonna bring my my W Series bucket hat that I have on here. Uh, and Good I'm, hat. I'm, exci- I like I'm excited that hat. for it. Thank you. I appreciate that. Well, I I'm excited. Hopefully, we can hit some of those together as credentialed 
members of the media. I would like that's you know I've been to the 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 Indianapolis 500. I've been to the the NASCAR races, Daytona 500, and, and, and such. Now I want to get to I want to get to an F1. Uh, I want to get their media uh, credentials so I don't have to pay for everything because it's really expensive. But somehow, some way, Jess, we're going to be at a race together at some point. Absolutely. And if it's in Vegas, like, sure, I'll, I'll go just to meet up with you, Mike. Don't worry about it. Oh, that'd be a real arm twister, huh? Oh, my God, I have to go to Vegas. What a bummer. Somehow I think you'll survive. I'll take you to the blackjack tables. Ooh, I'm in.